Thank you for joining us today. If you are not an ATA member, please consider joining at https colon slash slash atalink.org slash become a member. If you have a suggestion for a future seminar, email it to ata at atalink.org. As always, we have an amazing program for you with Major General Stacy Hawkins, the Director of Logistics, Civil Engineering, Force Protection, and Nuclear Integration, Headquarters Air Force Material Command, joining us. The views expressed in this presentation are those of the speaker and do not reflect the official policy or position of the United States Air Force, the Department of Defense, the United States Government, or the Airlift Tanker Association. Please take advantage of the question and answer feature in Teams to submit your questions anytime during the presentation. There is no need to wait until the end of the presentation portion to submit your questions. The earlier we get to your question, the earlier we get your question, the more likely we are to get to it in the time allotted. Before we get started, I would like to hand it over to the Airlift Tanker Association Senior Vice President, Lieutenant General Retired Chuck Johnson, to kick things off. Right, thank you, Alex, and I uh, want to extend a great big welcome to all of our Airlift Tanker Association uh, chapters out there. And I uh, also welcome our uh, chairman of the Airlift Tanker Association, John McNabb. Uh, good to have him uh, on board with us today also. We have a great speaker, a gentleman I've known from my uh, past Air Force career also, uh, General Stacy uh, Hawkins, <clears throat> for our leadership series today. <clears throat> And as you heard, he's the director of uh, logistics, civil engineering, force protection, and nuclear integration at uh, headquarters Air Force Material Command. And uh, so you say, what is uh, you know what is all that? Well, it is a big, big job spanning a tremendous amount of responsibilities. And uh, they uh, there are ten of them that I counted. Uh, so uh, uh, one is field and uh, depot level aircraft and commodities maintenance. Uh, two, new weapon systems uh, sustainment. Three, software engineering. Four, conventional munitions. Five, logistics plans. Six, transportation. Seven, supply chain operations and management. If that isn't enough, all of civil engineering and also all of force protection. And lastly, 10, uh, logistics information technology, which as we know is incredibly important uh, these days. <clears throat> He hails from uh, Bostrip, uh, Louisiana, and uh, General Hawkins, I thought it was kind of neat that your very first assignment in the U.S. Air Force was uh, at Barksdale Air Force Base, Louisiana, uh, as the OIC of B-52Gs and Hs, and KC-135, of all things, A models, uh, inspections and component repair branches. <clears throat> Been in the Air Force 30 years to date, and he's command squadron and uh, expeditionary group and the air base wing, and also at the air logistics complex uh, levels uh, at Ogden. <clears throat> he's led deployed uh, combat uh, logistics operations in Southwest Asia, in the Horn of Africa, and also in Korea. <clears throat> I thought it was uh, really uh, kind of neat that he served as a White House fellow, no small thing. Uh, and he worked at the U.S. Small Business Administration as, as the uh, fellow. And he also served as a special advisor to for defense policy and intelligence programs for the Vice President of the United States. He was selected as a Sloan Fellow for MIT. I uh, served as a uh, Air Force Maintenance Officer for the our great United States Air Force Thunderbirds. And lastly, which I thought was really kind of neat, uh, General Hawkins, uh, having uh, done this myself uh, as an Air Force Honor Guard, ceremonial guardsman for the United States Air Force uh, Honor Guard at Bowling Air Force Base, Washington, D.C. Well, General Hawkins, uh, welcome aboard. Uh, looking forward to uh, your great remarks today. Hey, thank you, General Johnson, sir. And uh, welcome and thank you for the opportunity to be here. And uh, hello, ATA family. Uh, one uh, duty that you uh, left out there is the duty that my wife uh, 
would uh, list first is the guy that takes out the trash. So <laughs> that's what she knows me best as and probably would say I do an average job at it. So uh, it's uh, awesome to be here. And thank you, Popeye, uh, for setting this up. Uh, it's uh, great coming back home. Uh, as, and I'll talk a little bit about uh, my uh, linkage to the mobility family. And although I've not uh, stayed in it for a full career, is uh, definitely the lifeblood that runs through me. So greetings from uh, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, headquarters AFMC, and on behalf of my boss, uh, General Bunch, uh, thank you to the Mobility family and the Mobility Warriors uh, for what you do on a daily basis uh, here at AFMC. We are proud to support what happens uh, across the Mobility Air Forces every day, and uh, it's uh, something that uh, we're proud to be a part of, and uh, we admire you uh, for what you do across the spectrum uh, every day. Uh, Joel McNabb, Joel Johnson, thank you for your leadership of ATA. And uh, I had a chance to renew my membership uh, this week and uh, just great to be a part of the family. And I've uh, been uh, in and out of ATA uh, as a member uh, over my career. And so I've uh, been to the conferences as well and learned a great deal just by interacting uh, and uh, interacting with mentors over the years. Uh, as I've been preparing to speak to you today, it's also been great to uh, really watch the videos that have been a uh, part of this video series over the past year, I presume. And uh, just great uh, to see uh, that effort, particularly in a pandemic environment, how you've been able to still connect and uh, lead and mentor uh, those across the Air Force uh, through this video series. I think it's probably as good or better as going to a PME, uh, the ones that I've watched. It's really uh, got me fired up and re-energized me uh, to uh, go out and continue uh, being a part of this great Air Force family. Uh, I will say up front, I am not the airman that I am today uh, without my day one exposure uh, to uh, Air Mobility Command and Mobility Air Forces writ large. Uh, as General Johnson mentioned, uh, my first assignment was at Barksdale Air Force Base, and I was the officer in charge of the inspection branch. And uh, we called it that back in the day because uh, I wore a, a strategic air command patch at Barksdale Air Force Base. And, that job, we did phase maintenance on B-52s and 135s. So the 135A model was where I cut my teeth first as an uh, OIC of, an ins of the inspection branch, and then I uh, had also the uh, commodities repair at Barksdale. This is 1991, and uh, those of you who have been tracking history, you remember that that fall, uh, General uh, President George H.W. Bush uh, stood down bomber alert, and uh, we started our reorganization of the Air Force the next year. And at Barksdale, I was part of the second bomb wing, but uh, I ended up uh, moving over to be a member of the 32nd Air Refueling Squadron in the 458 Operations Group, uh, where I was part of the KC-10 outfit. And for those uh, younger airmen out there, we once had KC-10s at Barksdale, Seymour Johnson, and March. And uh, I was part of the 22nd Air Refueling Wing at March Air Force Base back in the day. And uh, that was my first sortie generation flight line job. And so just going back uh, down memory lane and remembering that time uh, with the mighty KC-10, I uh, had a chance to deploy to Aldafra uh, in 1992 as part of Southern Watch. And um, really enjoyed that. And that's where the first impression, uh, at least the operational Air Force, those first impressions occurred uh, as, a, uh, as a member, uh, the day, day one of Air Mobility Command. Left the command for a while, came back as a squadron commander, and uh, was stationed at McGuire Force Base, uh, 305th AMXS, uh, C-17 AMXS, uh, Colonel, Colonel Woody Showwood, Colonel Randy Harvey, my group commanders there. And as all of us who've had a chance to uh, serve as squadron commanders, uh, it's the best job I think uh, I ever had and ever will have, uh, being that close to airmen and that close to the mission. And I just worked with some great bosses there. Uh, while I was a squadron commander, I had a chance to be a part of the 386th Air Expeditionary Wing uh, back when it primarily had C-130s. And I learned the difference between uh, a ground aboard in the fighter world and a ground aboard uh, in Herc Nation. Uh, when a fighter ground aboards, things kind of draw to a close and uh, you pretty much bet that that fighter is not going to fly on that go. When a C-130 ground aborts, it just means that it goes to the end of the line and uh, by and large that aircraft will get on the ground, get off the ground because of just the uh, the efforts of uh, those C-130 maintainers. So just a little bit difference in mentality. And uh, I definitely appreciated that being deployed to the AOR and the 386 Air Expeditionary Wing. 
And then my group command tour uh, back to the desert, and I was uh, in the 380th Air Expedition, Ex Expeditionary Wing. And uh, that job was uh, amazing because I saw the power of uh, air refueling, where those of you who've been uh, to the 380th, you know that from one postage stamp of a flight line, uh, we're able to uh, see the enemy, hear what he's saying, tell others about him, and act to defeat him. And uh, that's enabled by KC then, K KC-10s uh, on the flight line uh, in the AOR. And so I really enjoyed being a part of that organization. Uh, my time as the AMC A4, uh, also uh, eye-opening and illuminating. And uh, in the cornfields of Illinois, uh, Air Mobility Command Headquarters as a component to Transportation Command just does great work. And I really had a fulfilling time uh, as a MASHCOM 4 and AMC. So although I've been in and out of the command, uh, I really consider my time uh, as a mobility airman to have been, uh, the, it's been the times where I've learned the most about the Air Force. Uh, I found it most gratifying and I find the people in Air Mobility Command just to uh, be uh, top notch as far as the airmen that I uh, have most enjoyed uh, serving with over my career. So um, watching the videos of the previous se uh, uh, seminars, uh, again, uh, all gifts to me and uh, they, they've all been people who I've either worked with, worked for, or admired from afar. And uh, as I approach my 30th anniversary in the Air Force, I'm starting to wax nostalgic. Uh, I'm actually 10 days from my 30th year. And I'd like to bring up the first slide if I could. Uh, I think it may be showing. And the first slide, uh, this is, uh, a map from 1987, and uh, many uh, airmen probably don't even remember that there was a country called the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. And I reason, the reason that I put this slide up is that this is the reason why I joined the Air Force. Uh, as a high school uh, student, you know, I studied about the Soviet Union, and uh, I joined and wanted to wear the uniform because I wanted to be a part of uh, our mission then to uh, defeat the Soviet Union in a peer-to-peer -peer fight. Uh, as soon as I uh, joined and uh, attended the Air Force Academy, and by the time I graduated, uh, that fight was drawing to a close. And so by the time I graduated in 1991, the Berlin Wall had fallen. Uh, we were in a uh, new world order. And uh, let's go to the next slide. And all the way to today, we are actually uh, in a place where this is more or less the map that we uh, see as how the world looks today as far as the international system, uh, places where risk levels vary, uh, everything from violent extremist organizations to we still have peer-to-peer -peer fights, but uh, instead of just one peer, there are multiple peers that we uh, keep our eyes on. And uh, what this has really meant over the course of 30 years is that our Air Force has also had to change. Uh, and it's changed from uh, winding down uh, during the, uh, the 90s, the decade of the 90s, where we took advantage of a peace dividend to reacting and responding uh, to 9-11, uh, going through uh, the decades where we're fly fighting a global war against terrorism, uh, but now uh, actually reorganizing and uh, reorienting ourselves for a different type of peer-to-peer -peer fight. And as a logistician, uh, we spent a lot of time, uh, next slide please, spent a lot of time thinking about uh, this new fight and what's different about it from a uh, overarching theme is that uh, this fight is filled with VUCA. And uh, most people have uh, heard that term before. And it's an acronym where uh, it stands for volatile, uncertain, complex, connected, and ambiguous. And operationally, uh, we're fighting through VUCA, but from a logistics standpoint, we are as well. And we're trying to uh, look at the logistics problems that we're going to face and the problem set uh, that we uh, are focusing most on is logistics under attack or, or contested logistics. And uh, this problem set is uh, unlike what we uh, saw over the previous decades, whether we were fighting the Cold War or where we're in the middle of uh, a global war on terror. Uh, this is a constantly changing, uh, complex, uh, connected, disconnected, and constantly uh, ambiguous problem set that's going to really demand uh, innovation, agility, and uh, unique problem solving. Uh, to be able to get after it in the different ways that we're going to face it uh, over the next decades in the future. Next slide, please. So uh, every uh, career has a shot that you, uh, you you show when it signifies how things came that came together for you. And as I mentioned before, uh, my group commander tour 
uh, in the United Arab Emirates was where that happened for me. And I had an opportunity to really leverage all of the experiences that I had gained before and uh, be in a place where I could fully focus on the combat mission. Uh, definitely focused on my family from afar as well, but it uh, gave me an opportunity to really focus on the operational part of our business. You see these platforms and uh, that what uh, that's what our wing was composed of. And uh, when I use the term see, hear, tell and act, you can tell that those platforms all brought those capabilities uh, to bear. And we were able from one flight line, from one wing, uh, serve and support our combatant commander uh, with those capabilities. Uh, a proud moment, a lot of great airmen coming together to do that. Again, what anchored that wing was the uh, mighty KC-10. And uh, I'll be all, all of the other platforms would come and go, uh, but the KC-10 uh, was the anchor and was the foundation of being able to fuel the fight, but also to uh, keep these platforms in the fight. I also show this picture because we assembled uh, this amount of air power in one place at one time, and uh, it, it was a very permissive environment. Uh, we kept our eye on the force protection challenges and vulnerabilities, but by and large, we operated uh, unfettered in this environment. And uh, we all know that this next fight, uh, we're not going to be permitted to do that again. Next slide, please. And that's where this idea of contested logistics and what we need to do as a logistics community to prepare uh, across the logistics, engineering and force protection portfolio. And I try to think about this and compare uh, how we are looking at this to how the other services look at uh, what I would call their logistics organizing principles. You know, if we're soldiers, if we're in the Army, which we're not, you know, the organizing principle that the Army centers itself on is equipping the soldier. Uh, everything that the Army uh, looks at as far as how to uh, project capability wherever it needs to is really rooted in the equipment that it actually uh, invests in to actually uh, give to soldiers so they can actually employ uh, combat power. Next slide, please. For the Navy, and this is a uh, gender neutral phrase, but uh, the Navy talks about manning their ships uh, and we uh, look at how the Navy forward projects uh, sea power and it's based on having uh, technology uh, on board their ships, but it's also the people that they uh, logistically are able to assign to those ships, but also uh, to equip and sustain on those ships. And the Navy log logisticians that I've talked to, their organizing principle centers on that. Next slide, please. For the Air Force, you know, I would submit to you that uh, increasingly we're talking about how we fight our bases and uh, that's going to become uh, even more uh, complex uh, when we when we are in garrison and we're on a CONUS and or in a uh, secure place overseas where we have uh, allied protection. Uh, we aren't as uh, uh, we don't talk a lot about fighting our bases, but over the past uh, couple of decades, We've uh, definitely talked about it as we've been uh, deployed uh, to the uh, CENTCOM AOR. And I think increasingly, as we talk about what a base is in a uh, agile combat employment environment and an environment where you're gonna be uh, not just stationed, but you're gonna have to be able to move and maneuver within a certain theater uh, where you'll have bases that are temporary and uh, much less permanent than what, what we're accustomed to. But how we uh, prepare, how, how do we build multi-capable airmen that are uh, able to do more than just their Air Force specialty code duties, but how do we build these airmen who are multifaceted? How do we equip them? And uh, how do we uh, uh, enable and empower these airmen to make decisions at the tactical level in ways that we have not before? So across the logistics enterprise, when we look at uh, contested logistics, logistics under attack, uh, we see that as the problem set and uh, our functional leader, uh, Lieutenant General Warren Berry, has crafted an approach and the answer to logistics under attack is persistent logistics and persistent logistics, three components to it, posture, sense and respond. And uh, at going after these lines of effort, and if you think about posture, sense and respond and you uh, uh, connect that and you use uh, John Boy's model, the OODA loop, posture, sense, and respond is equivalent to understand, decide, and act. And when we look at all the things that we need to do over the next years uh, to posture resources uh, to overcome, particularly the tyranny of distance that uh, we are going to have to overcome in the Pacific, 
And I would commend to you, if you haven't already, uh, probably two editions ago, The Economist, this is the cover of The Economist, and it actually highlights what uh, has been known, uh, most of our leaders would agree that this is our most vexing problem. Uh, China is our most vexing problem, and a, a Taiwan scenario is our most vexing scenario. And actually uh, looking at uh, what we're going to do to enhance and improve logistics in our Air Force based on that problem set, I think it helps us to be able to morph and to transform our Air Force into what we need. And not just the China scenario, but other scenario scenarios involving peer competitors uh, where we will be in um, uh, unaccessible environments as far as denied environments. So. Uh, when we look at posturing, we're talking about how do we preposition supplies and how do we do that more effectively? How do we do it uh, efficiently? Uh, how do we uh, expand allied sustainment partnerships? Uh, when you look at acquisition cross-servicing agreements, how do we use our network of allies, which is a competitive advantage for us, uh, to leverage that from not just an operational standpoint, but a logistics and a posturing standpoint? Passive defense measures. Uh, lighter mobile energy production, all things that before the first shot is fired, how do we compete and how do we deter, but also posture so that when, if needed and if, if necessary, we aren't having to overcome uh, the logistics problems because of uh, the tyranny of distance. When we move to sense, what we're talking about is how do we basically support the decisioning uh, of our warfighting commanders? Uh, how do we provide that logistics common operating picture? How do we strengthen our C2 nodes? Uh, unprecedented situational awareness is going to be necessary uh, to be able to be successful in this fight. And then we talked about earlier empowering tactical commanders on the ground uh, from folks on the operational side, but also those logisticians, those defenders, and those uh, folks who are going to be building and sustaining our bases, uh, training and developing those leaders that are empowered and able to make those tactical decisions. And obviously, uh, the respond piece is the act component of this. And uh, it's all about leveraging autonomous systems, uh, being strategically adaptive, and being able to uh, respond if necessary and doing so uh, with speed and agility. So persistent, lo persistent logistics is how we're uh, looking at uh, our capability development initiatives, how we are framing uh, what we need from a resource standpoint, and how we're actually integrating uh, across service core functions, but also other communities as a supporting entity. Next slide, please. I'd like to just go over a couple of ways here at AFMC that we're actually uh, participating and uh, engaging uh, to uh, enable this persistent logistics approach to come to life. Uh, one is log IT. And uh, we all know that uh, our, our IT infrastructure and the systems that we currently use, uh, many date back to the 60s, uh, 70s technology. And so there are really three lines of effort that we're pursuing uh, to modernize our IT infrastructure and to uh, integrate it uh, more fully to particularly uh, enable that sense component that I talked about before. Uh, we're looking at IT consolidations. Uh, we have hundreds of uh, legacy uh, systems doing various things across the product support enterprise, the maintenance enterprise, our supply system. And so we've spent the last six years uh, consolidating those systems and just reducing uh, the number of uh, different systems, but also gaining efficiencies by doing so. The second uh, effort that we're uh, pursuing is uh, migrations. And uh, we uh, have been uh, undergoing uh, several cloud migration efforts. Uh, most recently, our integrated maintenance data system, which is a system that's used primarily in the combat air forces and the CAF. We uh, migrated that system to the cloud and what's happening is we're learning a lot. You know, we're learning uh, uh, a lot about the peril of uh, dated code. Uh, we uh, are now not assuming that uh, a cloud migration effort is easy. And uh, we're also uh, seeing that sometimes you may want to migrate a, a system to the cloud and other times you may not. You may want to keep it on premise. But as we go through this, uh, we feel that uh, to the extent that we move uh, a majority of our systems to the cloud, it's going to allow us to be able to uh, increase our analytics capabilities, which is going to uh, enable again us to be able to aggregate information, aggregate data, uh, collect it, synthesize it, trend it, and uh, deliver that uh, data and those uh, courses of actions coming from that data to the warfighter decision maker. 
And then the last line of effort, uh, I talked about it before, is that we're really pursuing uh, uh, data analytics, uh, those capabilities and how we can bring uh, data analytics environments and capabilities uh, to uh, the data pools that uh, we have across our enterprise to enable uh, faster and more agile decision making. So uh, that's our log IT um, portfolio here at AFMC. We work closely with the air staff and uh, we are uh, on a long journey uh, to uh, actually write the ship so that we can uh, do a better job of uh, supporting uh, our new war fighting constructs, particularly agile combat employment, but also persistent logistics. Next slide, please. Another uh, big problem that uh, we are uh, working on every day is supply chain risk. And uh, this is also a log IT vision. Uh, I won't go into a lot of detail on that, but that's just giving you a feel as to how we've mapped out that vision over the next decade. Let's go to the next slide. And I think that's the one on supply chain risk. So uh, we are learning that uh, warfare now exists beyond the battlefield. And uh, we've seen that just uh, recently uh, with the solar winds attack and uh, most recently with the uh, colonial pipeline incident uh, where most of the East Coast was compromised uh, from uh, uh, a hack on the uh, colonial pipeline uh, uh, IT system, if you will. And uh, what we're seeing uh, across our sustainment enterprise is that uh, our adversary, uh, our competitor, uh, China namely, uh, they are very, very serious about uh, not just uh, uh, competing with us uh, where we can see it or where we can monitor it from a military standpoint, but they are getting into our corporate DNA and everything from weaponized mergers and acquisitions, uh, how they have cornered uh, market segments, uh, even executive poaching. Uh, they are pulling all stops uh, to be able to uh, leverage uh, what they uh, can do uh, from a uh, corporate or financial standpoint to take away uh, our core advantages when it comes to innovation, our economic power, and uh, our, our innovation for that matter. And so uh, we are engaged and we have a uh, partner that we work with, uh, an industry partner, where we are working with program offices and uh, we are peeling back and conducting illuminations of the various supply chains that we depend on. And uh, we're able to go uh, multiple levels deep and uh, we are finding uh, across all of these silos, whether it's uh, uh, a financial silo, whether it's uh, an environmental uh, uh, silo, we're finding that uh, our adversaries are trying to influence and trying to uh, disable uh, our ability to uh, uh, sustain the security and to uh, sustain uh, the integrity of our systems that we need to uh, be able to produce and sustain our weapon systems. So this is a significant er uh, effort. Uh, we're getting lots of uh, support and partnership across the interagency with respect to supply chain risk management. And uh, we see this being an area that we will see scale uh, over the next years. Next slide, please. This is just uh, some uh, startling information. I think those of us who keep up with this, uh, not surprising, but uh, when you look at what China is doing and what they are sh uh, striving to do by 2025, uh, these numbers are pretty staggering. Uh, and it's not just uh, in the aerospace defense industry, but it's across all sectors uh, to include pharmaceuticals, uh, to include uh, semiconductors. Uh, there's just a, a tremendous uh, intent uh, from China in particular uh, to get after our economic instrument of power and uh, doing it at a very tactical and operational level. Next slide, please. Lastly, I'd like to uh, talk about, and this is not the last thing, but the next to the last thing, I like to talk about weapon system sustainment. And uh, this is uh, an opportunity to really describe uh, what we're seeing on the horizon uh, as an Air Force. Uh, many of you have heard our chief uh, talk uh, very eloquently about legacy weapon systems and uh, what we need to do to modernize. Uh, if you have not uh, already, I would commend to you the uh, Chief of Staff's article that's co-written with the Commandant of the Marine Corps. And the name of the article is Redefine Readiness or Lose. And in that article, uh, 
the thesis is is that in the Air Force, we've uh, commonly focused on platforms. And uh, even throughout this briefing, I've talked a lot about the different platforms I've worked on. And uh, in logistics, we talk a lot about availability. And what our chief is uh, driving us to do, and uh, we are actually doing it here at AFMC, is that we are changing our focus from availability uh, and focusing more on readiness. And uh, we're also uh, focusing less on platforms and focusing more on capabilities. We've talked about capabilities before, and uh, this is not a new uh, change for us, but doing so in earnest and doing so in an environment where we are resource constrained. And so this is very Churchillian as far as uh, we've run out of money and now it's time to think. And the hard decisions that uh, we will need to make over the next uh, months and years are gonna involve uh, really, really uh, determining and deciding which capabilities are most relevant for the peer-to-peer -peer fight. And uh, if those capabilities uh, drive us to certain platforms, then those will be platforms that we will keep. And if those platforms that uh, we have in the inventory aren't capable of uh, providing those capabilities, we're going to have to uh, uh, build a strategy to divest of those platforms. And uh, just as recently as last week, uh, the chief made a statement about uh, the fighter vision moving from seven platforms to four. And uh, there were some notable platforms that were not uh, a part of that list and that uh, caught the uh, media by surprise. But we're doing that here at AF AFMC as well. And uh, what we uh, call our readiness preservation account is our weapon system sustainment account. And as, a, as you can see over the past years, uh, stated requirements are outpacing the funding that we receive. And so uh, we are in the midst of a, uh, a zero base review currently to actually get after that. And uh, we're going to uh, really hold ourselves accountable and uh, in a non parochial way, uh, look at uh, this uh, problem, uh, more requirements than we have money to actually resource. And we're gonna apply uh, the capabilities uh, framework, capabilities and uh, readiness framework to it and make decisions based on what capabilities are our warfighters asking for, what readiness levels do we need to sustain, and how do we do that uh, with the right size force structure uh, to be able to do that not just today, but in the out years as well, all the while modernizing uh, with those new capabilities that we need in order to win the next war. Next slide, please. And I'll end with this story. Uh, when I was the AMC-4, I uh, had an opportunity to be a part of a lot of uh, operations as far as supporting it from a staff standpoint. And anyone who's been in headquarters AFMC, uh, you know it's a, uh, every day you're doing real world stuff. Uh, I will go to uh, an experience I had and I was on the staff uh, when we actually uh, uh, conducted the order of departure from Turkey. Uh, many of you probably remember that. And I learned an important lesson uh, from that experience. Uh, we spent a lot of time when we knew that we were going to uh, basically uh, conduct that operation, which was essentially moving families out of Turkey and uh, moving those families to Ramstein. And we uh, planned it, worked with the units there, and uh, got to a point where we thought that we had a tight plan and everything was locked solid. Uh, we uh, started to uh, work with the units in the field to uh, execute that plan, and all of a sudden we got a call. And the call was, hey, uh, this mission has paused. We're at a work stoppage and uh, we can't get the families to get on the plane. And uh, perplexing to hear that, wondering what's going on. And uh, we found out in short order that the one thing that we hadn't thought about is that we forgot about the pets. And uh, we forgot that, hey, you know, if you're a family and you're being ordered to leave somewhere and uh, you can't take your pet with you, that's probably gonna factor into your decision calculus. And so I have that slide up just to uh, show, and I use it every day, and particularly used it last year, uh, the opportunity to lead, the opportunity to uh, become and serve as a servant leader is really a humble uh, experience. But uh, one tool that I've uh, used since uh, going through that process as far as learning, uh, you know, I, I learned that you should always ask people what's important to them. And uh, you're gonna get a different answer depending on how you frame that question. But if you can find uh, to uh, find a way uh, to uh, through empathy, uh, share uh, someone else's values and understand where they're at, uh, I think it can take you a long way. So just wanted to share that story with you as something that I learned from being a mobility airman uh, in a real, real world operation that uh, has definitely become a leadership uh, lesson that I've carried with me since then. 
So uh, I know I've rambled on a lot, but just wanted to give you a feel for what we're thinking about as logisticians in the world of logistics. Uh, it's humbling to talk to you today. I appreciate the opportunity and I'll stop there to see if there are any questions that I can make a, a, an attempt to answer. I don't think there was any rambling going on there at all, General, uh, but we do have lots of questions. So the first question is from Dan O'Daniels at Booz Allen. General A. Hawkins, thank you so much for your time, insight, and leadership. Have we gotten better at sharing information across A4 and A3 IT systems to ensure in execution we are not trying to get higher mission-capable rates from weapon systems than the Air Force programs for, particularly as we try to push logistics into a contested environment? Yeah, thanks, Dano. It's a great question. Um, short answer is we haven't gotten there yet. Uh, and the, the information sharing uh, right now, we have been focusing on mainly logistics systems. So when we talk about other communities and the uh, data flow that needs to happen uh, to enable uh, accurate forecasting, but also uh, accurate execution, you know, and all of this also will inform, you know, future funding levels if we can get uh, all of our systems talking to each other. And uh, I think that as we uh, see, particularly, uh, we have a chief data officer now. Uh, we have uh, some uh, tremendous leadership in our SAF CN organization. And I think what they are challenging us to do is uh, while we bring in uh, environments that allow us to move data to, as we do that, then I think we're going to see that data sharing uh, become more robust and more broad. But uh, we have a ways to go. And uh, right now, I think we're focusing on the community by community approaches. And then what will come after that is the, uh, I guess, the inter-community uh, cross-pollination that you're describing. Great. So thanks so much. The next question is an anonymous question. It says, uh, how will the Air Force prioritize lethality requirements in a contested battle space where there are more receiver requirements than tanker capacity? Yeah, another great question, you know, and it's a definitely a question that if you're a, a JFAC or a theater commander, uh, you know, has to be top of mind. Uh, when I was, again, my assignment uh, in the UAE in the 380th AEW, I saw that firsthand, albeit from a field perspective. And uh, the appetite, you know, uh, for, uh, for for target uh, dimpies, <laughs> whatever you want to call it, the appetite to address targets and the receiver capacity, I think it's been an age old problem since we've, uh, you know, been in this modern era of our Air Force, I think going back to the airland battle days. So I think um, the way that I would address it, uh, probably a little bit out of my lane, uh, I think as a logistician, my approach to it is how can, as logisticians, how can we innovate, advocate for resources, but mainly innovate and so I'm thinking about this as to how can we improve uh, our maintenance capability and our maintenance effectiveness to improve uh, aircraft availability, but also uh, aircraft readiness uh, to give that warfighter more options to consider. And uh, can we say that we will always be able to provide enough? Maybe not. But I think in the logistics community, and we're doing a lot of uh, things uh, that we have seen great success. Uh, one initiative is called Theory of Constraints. And uh, at Fairchild Air Force Base, for instance, uh, we have improved the aircraft availability tremendously. I don't have the exact numbers, but there's been a tremendous turnaround also at Kadena Air Base, where we've just looked at our processes and we've used Theory of Constraints to remove those constraints and to make sure that our resources are being applied to the right places at the right time versus spreading our resources thin. So I think to that larger question that's I, that I really think is an air component commander question, uh, the thing that uh, a logistician can do at the operational and tactical levels is to really get after that process improvement to improve the availability. So we have optimal availability uh, and we're getting the maximum out of the fleets that we have. 
Great. I like the logistician uh, perspective on that. We always hear from the operators, but we don't hear, you know, the planes don't fly without the parts, without the equipment that they need. So it's great to see that picture. And, uh, you know, having been a commander in the desert, I, I can tell you that my MC rate was better than all the stateside bases because I had the parts and equipment I needed yeah. to go hack the mission. So it really is important. The next question is another anonymous one, and it's how has COVID, effect, how has COVID affected AFMC and what has the command learned? Yeah, so uh, COVID I, has definitely affected the FMC, and it's probably in a way that it has not affected uh, units that are uh, that have been challenged to sustain field operations. Uh, what the main lesson we've learned at AFMC is that telework works, and uh, I think uh, many of you know that AFMC is, uh, is is the MASCOM with the largest civilian population, and uh, I've been in the command, in and out of command for the past uh, five years. Uh, except for uh, one time and that was my time at AM AMC. But AFMC, uh, before COVID, uh, we really had somewhat of an aversion to telework. Uh, we were skeptical of it. We wondered how could we manage our teams and workforce in a telework environment. And uh, COVID happens and uh, we're forced to go and, and do it. And lo and behold, uh, you know, instead of being skeptical about people and whether they would show up to work, the real, the real problems that uh, arose were really, hey, how do we uh, basically try to afford people an adequate work-life balance because people are working too hard? And uh, we found that uh, in some ways effectiveness increased. We also found in many ways morale decreased. So it really forced us to rethink and reimagine uh, not just how we work, how we team, but also how we connect. Uh, now we do have test units in AFMC as well. And so uh, those resemble, as you well know, uh, the operational uh, units that are across our Air Force. And uh, we also had to really look hard as to how we uh, sustained and, and uh, how, how we would keep our test missions, missions going, uh, particularly when uh, our test maintainers were primarily civilian. So uh, walking through that uh, in probably uh, nuanced ways than what you would see at your more operational commands, but I think we are forever changed, uh, particularly from what we learned uh, from telework and being able to uh, accomplish it during a pandemic, but also uh, just a resiliency piece as well as to how do you keep uh, your workforce and your team motivated, connected, and inspired when you aren't able to uh, have that in-person contact. So do you think it'll ever go back or do you think this is the new normal for AFMC with telework and is this actually going to save us money and efficiency and uh, yeah. get us some get us some improvements where we would not have necessarily done these things prior to COVID? Yeah, so this is when I'm going to cleave to your disclaimer. This is definitely Stacey Hawkins talking. Um, I think uh, I can't see us going back. Uh, I think the, there will be a new normal. Uh, I think we will find ways to leverage in-person contact to get after those uh, human uh, human issues as involving connectedness. I think there's an opportunity to save uh, a lot of MILCON resources by doing this right and doing it in a coordinated way. Uh, I don't have the answer as to how that's going to work, but uh, you know, if you were to say, OK, uh, the MILCON projects that I have on the books right now that I'm lobbying and advocating uh, for resources for, uh, what's the telework rubric that you can apply to any MILCON project to determine how large a building needs to be, uh, how much renovation needs to occur, and uh, finding uh, that optimal uh, uh, that ratio, I think uh, we're going to have to come up with something because the uh, savings and the cost avoidance, uh, it's going to be, uh, uh, I think it's going to be transformative as to what the, what we're going to be able to do with the dollars that we save uh, from uh, from uh, leveraging telework more. Well, we, we super appreciate that insight and, and, and your honesty and willingness to, to talk about that. The next question is going to be uh, just as hard. Uh, so uh, General, how do we compete with a nation like China with a state-run defense industrial complex? Does our for-profit system put us at an advantage or a disadvantage and why? Yeah, so uh, tough, uh, great question. So I'll start out by saying, I, I, I always will. I will always bet on America and our system. Uh, I will always bet on our free market system. Uh, where I think uh, what we're seeing now as far as China leveraging a state run economy and what it's able to do, you know, uh, I want to go logistics on you again. I was 
the most impressive thing to me, and this sounds like I'm being too complimentary, I was impressed as to how effectively China was able to shut down once they decided they were going to shut down and quarantine uh, to uh, address the pandemic spread. And I just remember watching on TV how quickly they were able to do it. And that same thing likely could not have been done in this country. Yeah, it's because of our values. It's because of uh, how Americans think. Uh, you know, we are a why country. And so I think there are advantages in having a state run uh, country. Uh, I think that uh, I think they're temporal. Uh, I think there are advantages, even though there are drawbacks to having a, con a country that's more free market, uh, that's harder to uh, mandate things. But I think that in our system, we can scale faster and I think we can innovate faster and more and, and more capably uh, than any place on Earth because of the way that we're set up, uh, because of the free market dynamics that uh, we uh, uh, we preserve. Uh, it fosters innovation. I think it will allow us to pivot much more quickly. Uh, it's just going to be sometimes a little clunky for us to get there. So, uh, you know, the talk as far as where China is and how far behind we are, um, I think it's important to acknowledge that and recognize that there is a uh, not so much a gap that we need to close, but I think there is a margin that we need to sustain and increase so that we stay far ahead of China. I think we're going to have to really look at how do we, from an aerospace defense standpoint, how do we leverage the existing industrial base? And I, if you've uh, seen General Barry's comments in the media recently, uh, we have an industrial base that's probably uh, too small and uh, too uh, few companies um, making uh, consisting being being in that uh, in that space now. And I think uh, driving more competition, but also driving better performing public private partnerships, uh, that has to be uh, uh, an, an imperative uh, going forward. I'll share a story with you. I uh, work with uh, a lot of our industry partners a great deal. And in my job, uh, last job at a depot, we dealt a lot with industrial partners. And I would always use you know, the phrase, hey, you know, we got to have shared risks and uh, we need to identify what our risks are and we have to share risk in order to make uh, this partnership uh, fruitful and a wise mentor uh, who was uh, in an industry partner said hey well instead of using the, the term risks how about we talk about shared interests and uh, it was a flip on where i was trying to drive the discussion but it was a flip for the better because if you're able to arrive at shared interests and you're dealing with an, an industry partner then you can find those places where you have common ground while preserving uh, what you're there to do. And, um, you know, I make no bones about it. And most of the folks who I work with will say the same. Our industrial based partners are uh, there to drive shareholder value. And that comes in the form of establishing and sustaining a profit to meet their shareholder commitments. Uh, on the organic side, on the government side, we have a different focus. But somewhere uh, there's a Venn diagram opportunity for us to find where those goals align and that we can uh, actually build a relationship and build an effective partnership based on metrics and results uh, by aligning uh, those shared interests. And it's really helped me reframe that because I, I'm convinced that public private partnerships are here to stay. Uh, we're not going to be able to take on this pure fight uh, alone as a government entity. Thanks, sir. Uh, you know, again, some some great insight on there, and uh, I think you hit the nail on the head in the partnerships and, and, and the way ahead. But the peer fight is a tough nut to crack, especially with the way our peers operate. The next question is from Chief Fry. Uh, he's going to put you right here on the spot and say, if you were SecDef, what action would you take to make the military more diverse and inclusive? It's a great question, Chief. Uh, yeah, first, uh, obviously, I don't think about being SecDef <laughs> at all. So I think this diversity, and I'm not going to pivot, but I'm just going to talk about the diversity and inclusion because it's been um, uh, it's been a very big issue over the past year, and you can probably imagine uh, I get asked a lot about diversity and inclusion. So I think Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force Bass uh, said it really, really well, uh, and she said, you know, people want to know what's the difference between diversity and inclusion, and she said uh, it's really resonated with me, and I'll tell you why in a minute. But she said diversity is being asked to the dance. Inclusion is being asked to dance. 
And as a uh, awkward teenager that went to a lot of high school dances and I never got asked to dance, that really resonated with me. So, uh, you know, I think when we look at uh, inclusion in particular, uh, and I think the question is, what would I do as SecDef? You know, I uh, there was a 60 minute special recently and uh, Secretary Austin uh, actually, you know, talked about that. And he talked about things that he's looking at doing uh, to try to, first of all, infuse uh, diversity uh, into our organization to build uh, a culture that's sustainable. Uh, I tend to look at it um, from a grassroots standpoint. You know, I think diversity and inclusion and improving it is built on one conversation at a time. It's built on one relationship at a time. I've really, really uh, come to believe that you got to go where people are at. Um, I'm from Bastrop, Louisiana, like uh, General Johnson said earlier, and I'm from a town uh, where uh, 20 miles from where Duck Dynasty uh, was filmed. And uh, my parents uh, went to uh, Grambling State University, historically black college. They, their first jobs were school teachers in a segregated school system. And when I was in high school, my high school still had segregated proms. And so, you know, I, I really, um, and this sounds somewhat strange, but if you grew up in that environment and you're black, you have a certain perspective about things. And for me, those perspectives didn't change until the first time I traveled west of Dallas, Texas to go to the Air Force Academy. And um, I go to the Air Force Academy and for the first time in my life, I saw an interracial couple. And coming from my environment, I thought that was very strange, but that's where I was at. And over time, the Air Force acculturated me into the person I'm at, the person I am today, where I am in, I embrace uh, ten times more than I ever did growing up as a kid in Louisiana. I also have to have empathy for someone who grew up in Bastrop, Louisiana, who endorsed and preferred to have a segregated prom. Whether I agree with that or not. I need to have the empathy to have a conversation with that person without having an adversarial conversation with them. And I think when we can go there uh, as an Air Force and uh, many people are every day, I think our sensing sessions have really uh, done a lot to help us have those conversations. Uh, I think we can start to see the needle move on people understanding the value of diversity, the value of inclusion, and particularly practitioners of leadership executing it, implementing, implementing it, and making it a part of their toolbox. Uh, and it's something as simple as asking someone to uh, attend a meeting uh, when you otherwise wouldn't, including someone on an email in the CC block when you otherwise wouldn't, but really opening up uh, our organization to embrace all uh, types of thinking, all types of thought, all backgrounds, all perspectives, and, uh, and doing that one relationship at a time. So I guess if I were to sec def, I would probably mandate sensing sessions. I, I think the, your empathy piece was just so powerful there. I was lucky enough to have a chaplain student that taught me about the platinum rule, and it's not treat people the way that you want to be treated, but treat people the way they want to be treated. Learn mm -hmm. what they want what they, because you could be trying to do something great, but you're mirror imaging what you want on another person that has different experiences yeah. And your yeah. good efforts could just blow up in your face. So uh, yeah. that empathy piece is, is really just so, so important there. So we're going to have time for one or two more questions. Uh, let's start with a pretty easy one uh, here. Uh, what do you think the biggest challenge is facing military logistics in the next 20 years? I think 20 years, I think it's in the log IT space. I think it's going to be uh, how do we collect data? Uh, how do we store it? How do we uh, trend it, analyze, synthesize it? and uh, use that to, first of all, make logistics decisions uh, in the rear echelon, but also how do we bring that to the fight to make the most effective and efficient logistics decisions uh, that will uh, allow us to be able to support multiple warfighters. So in a nutshell is the, how do we reconcile the efficiency effect effectiveness spectrum? Uh, how do we operate along that nexus and understand uh, in, a, in a very agile way how to swing the pendulum back and forth to either uh, when we need to uh, very quickly. And I think all of that is going to be based on how we manage what I would call ubiquitous data flows and how we control those flows, aggregate them, and uh, use uh, the data that we have. So this is not data we have to go create. Use the data that we have to inform better decision making. 
Great. Now I'm going to finish up with, I said, it's one of my favorite questions. You know this one's coming, uh, especially since you watched a bunch of the other uh, seminars. But can you tell us a story about an airman that impacted you? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I, I watched enough and I said, OK, this is one that's coming. And uh, this may be cute, uh, but the first thing that comes to mind, you know, when uh, I'm asked that it, it, it's not a single person, but it's a single and I'll just say a single class of people. And, uh, and I'll call that uh, these airmen are senior non-commissioned officers. Uh, I grew up, uh, came into the Air Force as a maintainer. Uh, the first person I met when I went to Hangar 1 at Barksdale Air Force Base uh, to uh, report in as a second lieutenant was Senior Master Sergeant Tony Thompson. And uh, he looked at me, he said, Lieutenant, welcome. Uh, he said, uh, you're, our, you're our officer in charge. And so you're in charge here. And I, we're going to ensure you're successful uh, as long as you do everything I tell you to do. And so uh, Senior Master Sergeant Thompson shaped uh, me as to, first of all, I knew, uh, I learned at the academy that uh, I was going to work closely with our world-class enlisted force. But uh, I tell you that first experience and relationship as, as far as having a uh, senior non-commissioned officer mentor me, uh, critique me, hold me accountable. Uh, it's been a recurring theme across my career, and uh, I am a product of uh, senior NCOs and chiefs and every single assignment to include the one I'm currently in. Uh, the most uh, impactful airman uh, that's shaping my thinking, that's uh, uh, making me think twice about decisions that I may be making too abruptly. Uh, it's always a chief or a senior non-commissioned officer in the room uh, who gives me uh, ground truth, uh, who holds a mirror up to me to let me know uh, how I really look. And uh, it's been very, very effective. So it's, uh, I think when we talk about competitive advantages, uh, it's our free market system, of course, it's our innovation, of course. But uh, as we've been told by uh, adversaries and uh, allies alike, uh, no one on earth uh, can possibly develop nor sustain uh, an enlisted force like the one that we have. And I, I think that's really been what uh, has uh, enabled me to serve for as long as I have. Well, on that sentiment, sir, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you for your closing remarks before we go uh, to uh, General McNabb and General Johnson for their closing remarks. OK, over to me. Absolutely, sir. OK, great. Hey, great. So just want to uh, just reiterate, I, I trust everyone is uh, staying healthy and safe. Um, I trust your families are as well. Uh, I think this is an exciting time uh, to be serving uh, as a uh, Air Force Airman, but really as mobility airman. And when you look at uh, what the mobility machine uh, across all of the mission sets from air refueling to airlift, from uh, en route support, aeromedical evacuation, uh, you name it, uh, even uh, when you look at command and control. And in this job, you know, I, I'm the A4, but I also have the A410 uh, as part of my uh, portfolio. And today was a more of a 10 day than, than, a, than a four day. And uh, you know, people really uh, forget uh, AMC's role or the mobility uh, machine's role as far as uh, sustaining our nuclear enterprise as well. And I think uh, when you look at uh, the future and when you look at what mobility needs to be, in the future. Uh, one paper that I still read a, a lot is a paper that was penned by Lieutenant General Ty Thomas, and uh, the paper is titled Persistence and Position. And in that paper, he talks about fuel, he talks about nodes, he talks about command and control. And I think all those things will be the glue that uh, basically uh, keeps our Air Force relevant and uh, makes our Air Force uh, feared and, uh, and powerful as we do really uh, three things that uh, we're going to have to do simultaneously over the next decade, and that's compete, deter, and win. And uh, I think the, the mobility enterprise is going to do what it's, what, it's, what it's always done uh, to uh, innovate and uh, to uh, evolve uh, to, uh, to assure that reality. So thanks a lot for the opportunity. I really appreciate the opportunity to participate in this series. Well, again, it was just a pleasure having you. Uh... Lieutenant General Johnson, over to you for your closing remarks. Okay, thank you, uh, uh, General Hawkins. Thanks, uh, thanks so much. Uh, I uh, took a lot of notes. Uh, you said a lot of uh, very, very important things. Uh, the the whole uh, line from VUCA to, to logistics under attack and contested logistics and persistent logistics, uh, et cetera. I 
I thought your thoughts on uh, log IT modernization is, is powerful in respect to the supply chain risk uh, as a contested space, and uh, it's linked to the industrial base. And I can tell you my, my time in the industrial base, that was our number one challenge day in and day out was protecting that global supply chain. Um, I, I don't think people realize how tough a job that is, and especially how much of that now is is under uh, information technology. So uh, great, great words on that. And uh, I'd like to also foot stop your, your use of the word empathy. You used it three times and uh, shows the mark of a, of a really great leader uh, if you uh, use that word in anything. And, uh, and from the heart, uh, I think everybody could see that. I do want you to know that I, I did have a senior NCO mentor myself, uh, that being my dad. <laughs> <laughs> so, and ironically, the <laughs> first person I met <clears throat> mm. my first days was a senior NCO. Mm. And uh, so I can tell you started off on, on the right foot too, uh, Tracy. Hey, uh, thanks a million uh, from all of us in the Airlift Tanker Association. Uh, great, great job. I think a lot of us learned an awful lot. Uh, and uh, we're, we're blessed to have you uh, helping to lead our Air Force out there today. So I'll, I'll end there and uh, over to uh, you, Popeye, and then uh, General McNabb. All right, General McNabb, the floor is yours. Hey, Stacy. Uh, it's great to have you aboard, and again, as always, uh, I always come away whenever I've talked to you uh, enlightened and uh, and more optimistic about what we're doing. And uh, you bring that, you bring that uh, that optimism, which is really super. But uh, thanks for all that you've been doing, and you've been helping uh, behind the scenes on a lot of things that I've been working on. And I, I want to tell you, thank you for that as well, because in many cases, that's the underpinning of some of the things that uh, you are specifically handling. Uh, and uh, just want to let you know uh, how how important that is to me and uh, and to the logistics world and certainly the mobility world. So again, thanks a bunch for joining us. And uh, again, uh, you know, all of the folks in the mobility world, and I will tell you where we sit logistically, uh, and you think about mobility, it is one, still one of our greatest asymmetric advantages and uh, the logistics is what fuels that and uh, trying to make sure that we get that right and logistics under attack, uh, survivable logistics, all the things that we've been going on is going to make us better and more resilient and be able to, as you say, uh, deter or win, you know, and uh, and so that that's the, that's the key. So good on you and again, thanks a bunch. Thank you, sirs. Appreciate your leadership and example as well. So uh, again, thanks. I really enjoyed it. All right, that will conclude our presentation for today. Please join us on Friday, 25 June, when we are joined by Lieutenant General Sam Barrett, Director for Logistics J4 from the Jank staff at the Pentagon. Remember, if you're not an ATA member, please consider joining at https colon slash slash ATA link dot org slash become a member and if you have a suggestion please email us at ata at atalink.org the views expressed in this presentation are those of the speaker and do not reflect the official policy or position of the united states air force the department of defense the united states government or the airlift tanker association please send comments and suggestions for future topics and guests to us again at ata at atalink.org Thank you for joining us and have a great day.